In her last agony, St. Therese of Lisieux had several pictures of her favorite saints put by her bedside. By her was a lovely picture of the Virgin Mary, a small image of St. Joseph, and a picture of the great St. Joan of Arc. But also nearby her, and far larger than any of the other images, was a picture of the little-known French missionary, St. Théophane Van Art. The image of St. Théophane was different from the others. In it, St. Théophane stands on foreign shores, his left hand pointing up to heaven, his right hand gripping his missionary hat. Clouds gather in the background, but around his head, a light seems to emanate, dispersing the dark clouds in the ominous atmosphere. Beneath the saint are written the words, Farewell, farewell. We will see each other again in heaven. Before her death, St. Therese begged her sisters to study the life of St. Theophane and promote his virtues. And in one of her many poems, she claimed him as a brother saint, writing, O Theophane, angelic martyr blessed, all the elect to sing thy praise aspire, and thee to hail behold their stand confessed, the seraphim with love divine on fire. I, a poor exile, still on this dull earth, cannot with them my joyful song combine. Yet will I take my harp and sing thy worth, and claim thee as a kindred soul of mine. It was the Feast of the Presentation of Our Lady, November 21st, 1829. St. Theophane Venard was born. As was typical for Catholic families at the time, he was born into a home where religion was the defining aspect of the family. When reading saint lives, it is very normal to find biographers praising the saint's parents and explaining how the home served as the bedrock of their sanctity. This is certainly the case with Saint Theophan. As his biographer puts it, he combined the gentle, loving character of his mother with the firmness and resolution of his father. With his loving parents to care and guide him, he made great progress in virtue for one so young. He loved to spend time with his parents or siblings while reading the lives of valiant missionaries of Christ. One day with his family, after reading a particularly moving story, he cried out, and I too will go to Tonkin, and I too will be a martyr. On another occasion, he was with his father in the family goat field. With a surprising gravity, he asked, my father, how much is this field worth? Well, responded Mr. Bernard, presumably taken aback, I really don't know. Why do you ask? Because, replied little Theophane, if you could give it to me, I could have my share. I would sell it and should be able to go to college and study. After this, Mr. Bernard financed Theophane's studies in a minor seminary. Theophane flourished here despite having to endure the early loss of his dear earthly mother. Perhaps this is why, even in earliest youth, he vowed a special devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And as time would have it, he needed her help. The priesthood was the burning aspiration of Theophane's heart. But like every true vocation, it had to be tested. The gravity of the call, the lofty holiness required, and the chilling consequences for those who failed. All this filled Theophan's mind. To his beloved sister, Melanie, whom he copiously corresponded with all his life, he wrote, I always thought I was called to the priesthood. Sometimes I say to myself, what a glorious thing to be a priest. What it must be to say one's first mass. But then one must be so good, so pure. That is why I still hesitate. But confident in God's help, he continued to pursue his vocation. He soon entered major seminary at Patois. Here, Theophane practiced all the virtues which would remain prevalent throughout his life. His great charity, which is the very essence of the spiritual ascent, excelled from his earliest years. Throughout his entire life, he remained a dutiful son and a very dear brother to his family. He would continually write letters to his fathers and siblings, exhorting them to advance in love of God and neighbor, 
and begging their prayers. To brave the many trials missionary life presented, great confidence in God was necessary. He received all the confidence he needed from God and the Virgin Mary. Again, to his sister he wrote, Courage. God asks of us only goodwill. His grace does the rest. What I am most afraid of is lest you be discouraged. The Christian motto is hope, hope on, hope ever. And elsewhere, he would remind her, and we besides have a powerful advocate and one who deigns to be our mother. His devotion to Mary was an excellent example to his schoolmates. When he received his first Holy Communion, he begged his family to pray that the Queen of Heaven would prepare him worthily to receive her son. At a very early age, he became a member of the Children of Mary. When older, he joined the sodality of the Children of Mary, who established a chapel at his seminary. It was his great joy to be her sacristan at her altar. He would care for her altar and pluck flowers for the image there with childlike love, and it gave him more opportunity to steal away for prayer. Once in a letter to his sister, he reproached himself, saying, We must talk a little of the Blessed Virgin, for I feel I have not spoken enough of her this year. And to reproach himself for this error, he wrote, O oh Mary, how I love the word. Mary, refuge of sorrowful hearts. Mary, under whose wing we have sheltered ourselves, like little children, with their mother at the approach of the enemy. Indeed, in his letters to his family, the Virgin Mary seemed to be mentioned incessantly, which was the sign of his pious heart. But perhaps his most characteristic quality, and the one which made him so appealing to St. Therese, was his constant cheerfulness. St. Teresa of Jesus famously said, from silly devotions and from sour-faced saints, good Lord deliver us, and more explicitly, a sad nun is a bad nun. I am more afraid of one unhappy sister than a crowd of evil spirits. Without losing his sense of proper dignity, and with a hatred for uncharitable witty remarks, he was always a source of joy to those around him. His biographer notes that, when he lavished affection upon a friend or family member, he gave them all the love of his affectionate heart. From the bottom of my heart, he wrote to his sister, I do assure you I never was so happy. And again, try to fulfill each day's tasks steadily and cheerfully. The life of a true Christian should be a perpetual jubilee, a prelude to the festivals of eternity. At seminary, during the feast days, his cheerfulness was both heartwarming and memorable. When ill, his companions would quibble over who would get to wait on the saint. So pleasant and heartwarming was his company. St. Theophane was no sorrow-faced saint. This relates to what St. Thomas says in the second part of his Summa. He asks whether joy is affected in us by charity, the queen of all the virtues. He replies in the affirmative, saying that joy is caused by love, either because the thing loved is present, a love of union, or because one rejoices in the existence of the thing loved, the love of benevolence. Thus, this demonstrates the young Theophane was well grounded in charity, and love of God and love of neighbor. With these virtues, his courage and confidence, his great charity, as well as his constant affability and cheerfulness, he was well fortified for the rest of his missionary life. Soon after being ordained a subdeacon, he felt a special calling from the Lord. He did not just want to be a priest, he wanted to be a missionary, a foreign missionary. He was to leave the Patois Seminary and transfer to the House of Paris, which trained apostles who were to spread the gospel in Eastern Asia. Soon he told his heartbroken family. Before leaving for good, he spent a fortnight with them and did not leave without receiving the blessing of his dear father and the embraces of his disconsolate, Melanie. This is the last time he would ever see them, in this life at least. After studying in Paris for several years, he was, by the grace of God, ordained a priest on June 5th, 1852, at only 23 years of age. Father Theophane celebrated his first Mass the next day, Trinity Sunday. He wrote to his father, Send me your blessing. I said my first Mass today. Oh, what a glorious day for me. True, I cannot yet meditate very well, 
my head is still weak, and I can scarcely realize the awful mysteries of which I have become, as it were, a participator. But I feel a great peace, and am very happy. His first assignment was not long in coming. Just a few months later, he was chosen to be sent overseas. Before leaving, the missionaries celebrated the customary ceremony of departure. After communal evening prayer, the five departing missionaries would kneel on the altar steps. Soon after prayer and a short meditation, the missionaries ascended the steps and stood close to the tabernacle, while their confreres would kneel and kiss their feet, chanting, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, of them that bring glad tidings. Then the missionaries would give their brothers the kiss of peace and would depart to spread the gospel. Father Theophane sailed from Antwerp to Singapore and finally to Tonkin, the northern region of Vietnam. He wasn't impressed with what he saw abroad, especially the criminal opium drug trafficking. Tonkin was subjected to incredibly cruel persecutions. Since 1684, brutal assaults were leveled against the Catholics, and as one author remarks, the faith grew with head on the block and her children's feet steeped in blood. The authorities were vehemently opposed to conversion. I sometimes ask myself, St. Theophan wrote, is God's grace no longer so effective as before? Has the time passed for the conversion of the Gentiles? Or are we poor missionaries less zealous than our predecessors? It is quite heartbreaking to look around and to see nothing but heathen pagodas, to hear nothing but the bells of the bonzes, to witness only diabolical possession. Here missionaries live in holes and caverns, and a price is put on their heads. Nonetheless, St. Theophane continued to secretly preach the gospel. By night, he would steal into villages where the Christians awaited him. He would give them the sacraments, encourage them to hold fast to Christ, and then quickly hide elsewhere. Conditions were not always ideal. His house, if one can call it that, was constantly infested by different animals. In his own words, after a flood, I had fishes, frogs, toads, crabs, and serpents swimming about my room very happily. But what I disliked most was that the rats insisted upon taking refuge on my mat, and one night I squashed one while I was asleep. It was a disagreeable discovery, but on waking, I found a poisonous viper with black and white stripes, which had likewise coiled itself up on my poor bed as if to ask for hospitality, and was hissing just as I stretched my toes, so I forgave the rat. One of the crosses St. Theophan had to carry was his ill health, especially when he arrived in Tonkin. I am dying out like a candle, he wrote his family, and holding out like a mere thread. Due to spending too much time in water, he contracted asthma and typhoid fever on top of it, bringing him very close to death. He prayed to St. Peter of Alcantara, remembering that St. Teresa of Jesus said that God never refuses his prayers, and his sickness began to subside. Soon, several Chinese doctors, attempting to help, came to Father Theophan's bedside. Unfortunately, their solution involved applying little burning herbs to the patient's body. They warned Theophan that, if done improperly, their solution might leave him lame or blind. During their operation, they burnt him in about 500 places, 200 of which were near the lungs. My patients, wrote Theophan, and enduring this small purgatory has been renewed. St. Francis de Sales once wrote, The prayer of the sick person is his patience and his acceptance of his sickness for the love of Jesus Christ. Make sickness itself a prayer, for there is none more powerful save martyrdom. Sickness, according to St. Francis de Sales, is one of God's most precious gifts to those whom he loves. And St. Alphonsus Liguori teaches that the ultimate test for whether one is a true lover of Jesus Christ is how resigned one is to God during his sickness. After accepting these crosses, with his characteristic joyfulness, he regained his health. Now Theophe knew he would die a martyr's death. This was a common lot for missionaries in Tonkin, which was nicknamed the Martyrdom Assignment. Father Venard moved to a nearby pagan village and met with tremendous success. The town was completely changed, and the weak, faint-hearted Christians were transformed into valiant soldiers of Christ. For the authorities, this had to stop. One night, twenty men circled the house, 
Theophan was sleeping in. Let the European priest come forth, they cried. One of Theophan's friends had played Judas and turned him in. The brutal men grabbed the priest, took him to their chief's home, and threw him into a cage of bamboo. From this cage, Father, Ver Father Venard continued to write letters. To his beloved flock, he wrote the following. My dearest people, God, in his mercy, has permitted me to fall into the hands of the wicked. On the feast of St. Andrew, I was put into a square cage and carried to the prefecture. God knows what awaits me, but I do not fear. The grace of the Most High will be with me, and my mother Mary will protect her poor little servant. And he ended, Adieu, my best loved ones, till our meeting in heaven. In a moment I shall be adorned with the confessor's chains. Once more, adieu. It was only a matter of days before he would be executed. But before death, he wrote a final letter to his father, sisters, and two brothers. They were filled with encouraging notes and pleased to come and meet me in heaven. May I become, he wrote to his sister, only pure bread and wine fit for the master's use. I hope for this through the, through the mercies of my Savior and Redeemer. And you, I leave you in the field of virtues and good works. Reap a great harvest of these for the eternal life which awaits us both. Gather faith, hope, charity, patience, gentleness, sweetness, perseverance, and a holy death. And we shall be together now and forevermore. Goodbye, my Melanie. Good my, goodbye, my love sister. Adieu. The pagan judge called the great Mandarin interrogated Theophan before he was called to shed his blood. He asked the young man, whom he obviously pitied, many questions. Do you fear death? Great Mandarin came to reply, I do not fear death. I have come here to preach the true religion. I am guilty of no crime which deserves death. But if the Anamites kill me, I shall shed my blood with great joy for them. Chief of the Christian religion, the interrogator continued, you must declare the names of all the places and people that have sheltered you up to this hour. Great Mandarin, Theophane replied, they call you the father and mother of this people. If I were to make such a declaration, it would involve a large number of persons in untold misery. Judge for yourself whether it would become me to do this or not. Trample the cross then, and you shall not be put to death. How? The missionary cried. I have preached the religion of the cross all my life until this day, and do you expect me to abjure it now? I do not esteem so highly the pleasures of this life as to be willing to buy the preservation of it by apostasy. When the great Mandarin left, he felt great admiration and even love for, the, his, for his young, valiant prisoner. A few days later, Father Bernard was led to the scene of execution, looking serene and joyful. A hideous hunchback emerged. His job was to decapitate Theophane. Tauntingly, he asked Theophane what he would give to be executed quickly. The longer it lasts, the better, was the unexpected reply. Father Venard's attitude reminds one of that manly quote from St. Ignatius of Antioch when he was about to be thrown into the Colosseum. I am the wheat of God, and I shall be ground by the teeth of beasts that I may be become the pure bread of Christ. He was strapped to a stake, and his hands were tied behind his back. He lifted up his head for the stroke. A few seconds later, Theophane's head was hacked from his body. Soon after, his relics were collected and are still held in veneration. The clergy and people of Tonking were deeply saddened, but his legacy was to live on. His sister became a religious and took the name Sister Mary Theophane. Eusebius, his younger brother, would follow in his footsteps and become a priest. He did much in his life to promote devotion to his deceased brother. However, he confessed with a sigh to his brother's biographer that his dream of building a shrine to St. Theophane was never realized. But he still believed that the cult would grow because, he said with hope in his voice, perhaps America will come to love Theophane. St. Teresa of Lisieux possessed a very strong devotion to the saint, and one of her final consolations before death was to receive a relic of his. This man, who worked no miracles, was not a saint of locutions or visions, 
but who did remain childlike and humble all his short life. In short, a saint very much like Therese. In her last agony, the little flower had several pictures of her favorite saints put by her bedside. And one of these, the largest of the pictures, was of Saint Theophane van Aert. And she begged the saint to be with her at death and to escort her to heaven himself, writing, Come down from heaven at my last hour anew, O Theophane, thou youthful martyr blessed. Come with the virginal flames of thy pure love. Come to burn from my soul all earthly clay, that I may fly to heaven's courts above and join thy cohort in unending day.